This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform where entrepreneurs can easily create and customize their own personal or professional website. More on Squarespace later in the video. So hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about James Madison the genius of politics. And as with all of our videos, this one is based on an original article by one of our lovely authors at home. And that author is Larry Holsworth. If they provide a social media links for us, they'll be listed below alongside my own. But let's get to it. James Madison is often referred to as the founder of the United States Constitution. A highly educated son of a wealthy Virginia family, Madison studied theology in college yet never entered the clergy. He studied law in Virginia yet never practiced it. He regarded democracy as an unworkable form of government, yet argued for democratic representation of the people in Congress. Of all the founders of the United States, he was probably the most knowledgeable of the history and evolution of the representative government. He was a master of political science before that term even existed. A walking contradiction, he was trained by a clergyman but distrusted religion, argued for individual freedom, yet enslaved hundreds on his Virginia estate. Simple in appearance, quiet and thoughtful, he married a woman who later in life would be considered a celebrity. He's often called the father of the Bill of Rights, though it took considerable persuasion by colleagues before he would come to recognise the need for one in a new government. When he did agree, he was more a matter of political expediency than protecting personal freedoms. He was, above all, a politician of considerable skill. Like most of America's slave-owning founders, he did not espouse the equality of the races, though he did recognise the evils of slavery. In his later years, he adopted the views of transporting freed slaves to colonies set aside specifically for them, supported financially by the societies formed for that express purpose. To modern eyes, such views are racist. Yep. Yet in his day, they were alarmingly daring and quite forward-thinking. He was a product of his time who reshaped the world, and whose acts continue to reshape the world to this very day. James Madison Jr. was born on his family's plantation at Belgrove, Virginia on March 16th, 1751. He was the first of what eventually became 12 children born to James Madison Sr. and Eleanor Conway Madison, through whom he could trace his maternal lineage to the Brewsters and Allerton families, descendants of the original Mayflower Pilgrims. As a child, he was known legally as James Madison Jr., though he was often called Jemmy, a name he came to greatly dislike, in part because of his diminutive size. Of his 11 siblings, only five survived into adulthood. His early childhood was spent at Belgrove, later named Montpellier, after the construction of a large plantation home on the site. In his youth, Belgrove was near the Virginia frontier, and the fear of Indian attacks was part and parcel of everyday existence. Men went armed to the fields and went about their business. By 1760, the young Madison was acquainted with Virginia militia Colonel George Washington. Yes, that George Washington. His neighbour, Lord Fairfax, and other military and civic leaders of the colony. His early schooling was mainly through tutors, chiefly Donald Robertson, a Scottish scholar. At 17, Madison decided not to attend College of William and Mary, then favoured by Virginians for the education of their sons. His reticence was attributed to the school's location in Williamsburg, which was viewed as being unhealthy due to its proximity to tidal swamps and rivers. Instead, Madison entered the College of New Jersey, later to become Princeton University. University. Madison studied the classical disciplines of Greek, Latin and theology, as well as the emerging philosophies of the Enlightenment. He read the works of Isaac Newton, David Hume, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Immanuel Kant, Voltaire, and many others that we all like to name drop to sound smarter in conversations. In addition, he also studied the histories of Tacitus, Josephus, and other works of ancient antiquity. One of his classmates and friends was a young New Jersey native named Aaron Burr, three years younger than Madison. The Virginian's mind and work ethic was such that he completed the prescribed three-year curriculum for a Bachelor of Arts degree in just two years. Yet his habits also brought about fits of exhaustion, leading to him developing a reputation for being weak and sickly. Following his 1771 graduation, he elected to remain at the college for a time, learning to read and write in Hebrew, just for fun I suppose, as well as studying political philosophy under John Witherspoon, a Presbyterian clergyman and president of the College of New Jersey. His influence on young Madison was such that James returned to his family's plantation in 1772 with the idea of actually entering the clergy himself. Instead though, he remained at his family's seat, tutoring his younger siblings. In 1773, he began to read law, aided by a friend who recommended books for him to study. Though Madison is frequently referred to as a lawyer, he never actually considered himself to be one, referring to his standing as a student of the law only. He never sought admission to the bar or practiced law professionally. Settle down, class, settle down. We'll just be taking a short break from our presentation on James Madison 
to talk to you about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform suitable for anyone from amateurs to professionals. Squarespace makes it easy for you to create a website that you can use to promote yourself, engage with your audience, and sell your products or services. And to all of you sitting here who think you could do a better job than me, I'm looking at you, Emily, Squarespace allows you to set up your own online course. All you need to do is pick up a template that best fits your brand and upload your lessons. If you would like to charge for your course, you can choose whether you would like to sell subscriptions or offer your customers a one-time fee. Once your course is set up, you can customize it in any way you like using the, say it with me class, Fluid Engine. That's correct. With Fluid Engine, you can add elements to your page just by simply dragging and dropping them in. And then you can customize them however you like. Squarespace tracks everything, from visitors to your site to where your sales are coming from. Not only does this allow you to monitor the success of your course, but you can also use the data to figure out how to update your website or your course for the better. Check out squarespace.com forward slash biographics for 10% off on your first purchase of a website or domain using the code biographics. Right class, break is over. Back to the presentation. James Madison's studies, as well as the tutelage of John Witherspoon, led him to distrust the Anglican Church, which at the time exercised a considerable legal authority in Britain and British North America. In Virginia, for example, attendance at weekly services was mandatory, as was tithing and other forms of financial support for the church. Madison grew to oppose such power in the church over matters which he viewed as wholly secular in nature. During the years of the American Revolution, three distinct areas of political alignment emerged. Between 20 and 33% of Americans were loyalists. Loyalists remained aligned to the British Crown, the Anglican Church and Parliament, and specifically Parliament's right to enact laws and taxes in the colonies. A roughly equal number of patriots opposed them, arguing Parliament and the Church had exceeded their bounds regarding rule of the colonies. A significant number of American colonists, over one third of their population, and perhaps as much as half, supported neither side. Only a minority of American population actually support the revolution, while perhaps more importantly to the study of history, the majority did not. Madison, however, did. And though he did not serve as a warrior, his role was in shaping the newly formed government. He served the 1776 Virginia Convention, which created the first constitution for the state of Virginia, in which he insisted on the legal protections of religious freedoms. He then entered the newly created Virginia House of Delegates. As a representative, he participated in debates over the ratification of Articles of Confederation in 1777, which he opposed. Madison found the Articles of Confederation to be unworkable as the basis for a national government. Under the government established by the Article of Confederation, Madison was elected to the Congress, serving from 1780 to 1783. During that period, a largely powerless Congress dealt with the ongoing war, rampant inflation, and inability to impose taxes or tariffs, and other difficulties which his own bylaws prevented it from resolving. Congress could enact no laws which weren't agreed to by all 13 colonies, crippling it for all intents and purposes. Madison returned to the Virginia House of Delegates in 1784, where he ushered through the legislator of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedoms, written by Jefferson, who was absent in Paris during debates over it. The landmark document established the state religion in Virginia and later served as a precursor of the Establishment Clause of the United States Constitution. The weakness of the federal government under the Articles of Confederation led Madison to urge that they be amended through a convention attended by all the states. Among his many concerns were the benefits of representative democracy over pure democracy and the need to achieve equity in representation between the larger and smaller states of the Union. James Madison was not a large man. He stood about 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighed just over 100 pounds at the time when the average man stood about 5 feet 8 inches and weighed about 140 pounds. And this actually makes James Madison the shortest man to serve as president. The curious, the tallest was Abraham Lincoln who stood at 6 feet 4 inches tall. And the second place winner is controversially Donald Trump who claims to be 6 feet 3 inches tall and weighed just 215 pounds. Moving back to Madison, he wasn't at all sickly as he's often described and reports from contemporaries and he enjoyed robust health very late into his quite long life. He was quite sensitive regarding his size, often enduring insults from political enemies such as sneering references to Little Jemmy. 
He did not possess a strong speaking voice either and preferred not to engage in vocal debate in public. His preference was to present his opinions and arguments in writing. He arrived at the 1787 convention to address the Articles of Confederation with his position well prepared. Madison spent the years between 1783 departure from Congress and the 1787 convention studying the governments of republics from history and soliciting input of opinions from Thomas Jefferson, Edmund Randolph, George Washington, George Mason and many others. Jefferson himself was not present at the Constitutional Convention, but his ideas were included in Madison's document, now known as the Virginia Plan. Although he authored the Virginia Plan, Madison chose not to present it to the convention, leaving that task to his fellow Virginia delegate, Edmund Randolph. Randolph at the time served as the governor of Virginia, and Madison believed that he would lend a greater gravitas to the plan than he would with his less than imposing stature. The plan called for three separate branches of government, an executive, a legislative, and a judicial, each serving to check the powers of the others and thus establishing a balance of power between the three. He also called for a bicameral legislature with one body representing the people and the other their respective states. In the debates that ensued over the plans and the many, many compromises which were required in order to see its recommendations enacted, Madison remained largely on the sidelines. Eventually, the Virginia plan became the basis of the federal government of the United States, though it was heavily heavily revised by the delegates. Madison opposed nearly all of these changes. As passed by the Constitutional Convention, only representatives in the lower house of Congress were to be elected directly by the people. Senators were appointed by the state legislatures and the president and vice president were elected by electors sitting in colleges assembled. Though today he's often called the father of the Bill of Rights, and though he authored the Ten Amendments that came to be known by that name, Madison initially opposed a Bill of Rights in the Constitution at all. His views were that such rights were implied. He also believed that any rights not specifically enumerated would thus be denied. When his colleague, Virginia delegate George Mason, withdrew his support for the Constitution unless a Bill of Rights was added, Madison was reluctant to agree. Mason's opposition to the Constitution threatened its ratification in Virginia and ended his lifelong friendship with his neighbour, George Washington. Again, yes, that George Washington. Yet it also drew Madison's attention, who reasoned that, since such amendments were merely enumerated rights already implied, adding them to the document would appease those in opposition without undue harm. Madison wrote the first 12 amendments using Mason's own ideas, 10 of which were ratified as what is now known today as the Bill of Rights. An 11th dealing with the manner in which Congress paid itself was finally ratified in 1992, two centuries after Mason and Madison initially suggested it. So I've heard that the, uh, the gears of the federal government grind slowly but grind finely, but that's taking the piss. Madison was not known as an enthusiastic compromiser, yet he compromised in order to ensure ratification and the creation of the new government. Madison's support of the Constitution in letters that became known as the Federalist Papers did not include a Bill of Rights, and he even argued against one. Yet he gradually came to change his mind, persuaded in some part by Jefferson and then Mason but mainly by political expediency. When he ran for the new Congress against James Monroe in 1788, Madison made support for the Bill of Rights part of his platform. While serving in the Confederation Congress, James Madison, then in his 20s, resided in a Philadelphia boarding house. Madison favoured black suits, which made him appear as a minister or even an undertaker, an impression fortified by his reticence to engage in social niceties. Another Philadelphia resident at the time, socialite Peggy Shippen, who eventually married Benedict Arnold, yes, that Benedict Arnold, wrote that there was, and I quote, nothing engaging or even bearable about Madison's manners. He was, to Shippen, again to quote, a gloomy, stiff creature. We try. Nonetheless, James pursued a young woman who resided in the same boarding house, Kitty Floyd, the 16-year-old daughter of New York delegate William Floyd. By 1783, they had agreed to marry. During the summer of 1783, Floyd and his daughter returned to New York, accompanied by another resident of the boarding house, a medical student named William Clarkson. Madison spent part of his summer at Montpelier, and while there, he wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson that communications for his betrothed had ceased. Madison finally received a letter from Kitty in August, and he was informed that she had developed a preference for a young Mr. Clarkson, and that the wedding was off. Madison was desolate and withdrew even further from society. Not until 1793 did Madison decide to once again dip his toes into the dark sea that is 
romance. He was introduced to a young, recently widowed mother of two named Dolly Payne Todd by their mutual friend, Aaron Burr. By that point, Madison was somewhat of a local celebrity due to his efforts in creating, you know, the Constitution. He was also quite rich, which I can't imagine didn't help. Then a member of Congress, Madison proposed marriage after a few months. They were married on September 17th, 1794. Madison was then 42 years of age, 17 years older than his bride. They made their home in Montpelier and rented rooms in Philadelphia whenever Congress was in session. His much younger wife brought James Madison out of the shadows in many social settings, where he mingled with members of the now emerging political parties and discovered the value of back rooms in cutting political deals. Her role within government continued to expand over the ensuing two decades, when Thomas Jefferson entered the presidency in 1801, the first to take office in the new federal city of Washington. Madison was appointed as Secretary of State. Dolly Madison became Washington's leading hostess. The White House, the Capitol, and the offices of government were all in various stages of incompetence. Oh, sorry, incompletion. Th that wasn't a ju that was like a genuine misreading of the um, uh, the script. Streets were unpaved mires in rainy weather, and rutted dust tracks went dry. The State Department was located in a newly erected two-story building to the west of the President's Mansion, as it was then called. Madison State Department shared its quarters with the Navy Department, the War Department, the Treasury, the Patent Office, and the Post Office. So quite crowded. In this incomplete city of an often malarial climate, Dolly Madison became the leader of society. She was often asked to serve as the widow Jefferson's hostess for affairs at the president's mansions, and in their temporary residence on F Street, she held levies and receptions of her own. She hosted diplomats and their wives, members of the government, visiting dignitaries and leaders, and developed an international reputation as a gracious and gifted hostess. In the minds of many such dignitaries, she outshone her husband. In 1809, James Madison became the fourth president of the United States, the third from Virginia, and the first who had previously served at the House of Representatives. He entered the White House at a time of crisis with Great Britain over trade rights, freedom of the seas, and British transgressions on the American frontier. The Napoleonic Wars in Europe, in which the United States remained strictly neutral, damaged American trade. The policies of his predecessor, Thomas Jefferson, had crippled American shipping through his enforcement of an embargo over British goods. America was in no position to assert its rights through force. The Navy had been largely disbanded, and its few remaining ships remained idle in port. The Army consisted of a few regiments scattered throughout the frontier or garrisoning in unfinished ports along the eastern seaboard. On paper, after Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase, the United States stretched halfway across the North American continent. In practice, most of the west from Ohio to the Mississippi River was disputed between settlers and native tribes. Madison had supported the Louisiana Purchase as Secretary of State. As President, he found he lacked the means to actually enforce it. British possession and forts were found throughout the lands, purportedly owned by the United States. During the first two years of his administration, James Madison was forced to contend with depredations by both the British and the French. British ships stopped American vessels on the high seas, seizing sailors they claimed were British citizens and conscripting them forcibly into service in the Royal Navy. Meanwhile, French privateers and naval vessels just attacked American ships, claiming they were trading with nations at war with France, a direct violation of Napoleon's continental system. In the United States, two factions emerged, one demanding war with Britain, the other a war with France. A tough choice. Those demanding war with Britain, led by Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, became known as the Warhawks, which admittedly is kind of rad. The Warhawks also coveted Canada, believing it could be taken from the British in a short military campaign. They believed the Canadians would welcome the opportunity to become Americans, free of British rule. Like, spoilers, Canadians still have the like the Queen on their money. In June 1812, the Warhawks achieved a majority in Congress and James Madison became the first American president to request Congress to declare war. Madison informed the House that the nation could no longer tolerate what was, and I quote, a de facto state of war against the United States by Britain. Madison thus became America's first wartime president and would, in the course of the war, become the first sitting president to observe American troops in battle. In many ways, the war was a disaster for Americans. The Canadians demonstrated a decided reserve at the coming Americans, siding for the most part with the British. The nation's capital, including the president's house, the capitol building, and the officers of the government were burned. By the war's end, America's tiny navy was mostly bottled up in ports. Yet, there were some successes. 
minor successes, but successes nonetheless. America, for example, controlled the Great Lakes by the war's end. The threat from Britain's Indian allies was mostly neutralized, and Andrew Jackson's stirring victory over British invasion forces in Louisiana and Alabama restored national pride. The contending sides accepted the war's end as a, and I quote, status quo antebellum. In essence, a draw. Madison's presidency, which saw several inroads be made towards further strengthening the federal government, is irretrievably linked to the War of 1812. Yet he left behind a government that continued to maintain a standing army and navy, and re-established a national bank and system of taxation to support it. He also helped shape the role of the federal government in completing internal improvements such as roads, canals and ports, to stimulate the nation's economic and commercial growth. James Madison retired from political life at the completion of his second term as president in 1817. Like Washington and Jefferson before him, he left office a considerably less wealthy man than he had been when he entered it. Rebuilding his wealth proved elusive. He was hampered by poor harvest of his main crops, wheat and flax, and depressed prices at market. He was also burdened with debts not of his own making. You see, while James Madison had no children of his own, Dolly's two children were raised by him in his household, and in particular her son, John Payne Todd, was asked to manage his Montpellier estate when Madison had been in office. Todd was not very good at this and ran up considerable debts against the estate, debts caused by inattention to his duties and a penchant for drinking, gambling and collecting racehorses. In retirement, Madison struggled to pay off these debts. Like many of America's founders, Madison was raised in a system which relied heavily on the labour of enslaved peoples. His Montpellier estate, for example, included enslaved labourers which numbered more than 100 at times. In retirement, Madison did support the creation of societies which attempted to set up colonies for freed slaves, yet he did not free his own own, not even upon his death. In his will he actually left his slaves to Dolly with the instructions that they could neither be sold nor emancipated without their consent. There were instructions that Dolly soundly ignored. Madison's Montpellier estate became a haven for guests and relatives in his later years. Always depicted a stiff and informal person, Madison was actually very much the opposite at home, going as far as to participate in piggyback races on his plantation's lawns, with the former president born on the back of his wife, which I guess, so I guess being small had its benefits. His health remained with him until very near the end. He occupied his time by writing and rewriting his collections of the debates during the Constitutional Conventions, believing that Dolly could publish them after his death. He also served as a second rector of the University of Virginia, replacing its founder, Thomas Jefferson, in 1826. He died at Montpellier in June 28, 1836, from the effects of liver disease. Tradition has him dying quietly while dining at breakfast. He was buried at his estate. The following year, an impoverished Dolly moved to Washington, where she resided until her death, having been forced to sell the estate and its enslaved peoples to satisfy her debts. She died in 1849 after internment at the Congressional Ceremony in Washington. She was later exhumed and buried next to her husband at the grounds of their former home. Madison is known to American history as the father of the Constitution and of the Bill of Rights. Neither is wholly accurate. Perhaps his greatest legacy is one that's often forgotten, yet still germane. In his essay number 10, part of the Federalist Papers, Madison described what he called the tyranny of the majority in a democracy, as well as the duty of an elected government to protect and defend the rights of the minority. That remains the essence of the American Republic, and a source of heated debate in American life in a land where the majority doesn't always rule. So thank you for tuning in to this episode of Biographics. As mentioned at the start, I've been your interim host, Carl Smallwood. Yes, that is my real name. And this video is based on an original article submitted by the writer, Larry Holsworth. So if they've provided social media links for you, they will be linked below alongside my own. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like. If you've got any comments to say about it, leave them below in the comment section. In particular, I'd like to ask people to leave feedback about my presentation and hosting style. I'm trying to find something that is a good fit for the um, uh, the topics and uh, like you know established style and voice of this channel as um, uh, like you know refined to I'm gonna say to a mirror sheen by my esteemed colleague Simon Whistler who I'm happy to call a peer and you know someone I wrote a lot of articles for back in the day for top tens which is a sister site to um, uh, biographics as well as um, today I found out but yeah I'm trying to find my own voice and style so if any feedback about that let me know Otherwise, if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe, and as always, have the day you all deserve. Cheers.